Good morning. This is Gary Adams with the National Cotton Council, and I would like to welcome all of you to uh, the National Cotton Council's conference call and webinar regarding the recently passed seed cotton program. With the new program taking effect for this year's crop, we felt that it was important to disseminate the information as quickly as, as possible, and conducting a series of calls and webinars is the best way to do that. Uh, just remind you that the conference lines are, are in lecture mode until time for uh, Q&A. Also, for any of you that may be listening on the conference line and not joining by webinar or having any difficulties with the webinar, the presentation uh, that we'll be going through is available on the National Cotton Council's website, and you'll see within the chat window, uh, you should see the URL that will take you to that PowerPoint, uh, so that can be used. As a reference now, it's also available uh, after the conference call. By way of background, you'll recall that on February 9th, Congress passed a budget agreement that included a supplemental disaster provisions for agriculture. In addition, the legislation included the seed cotton program as well as provisions to improve the safety net theory. The seed cotton program represents the culmination of more than two years of concerted effort by the U.S to improve the support program by authorizing cotton's eligibility for the PLC and ARC programs within the 2014 Farm Bill. I want to recognize the diligent efforts of the staff of the National Cotton Council as well as the numerous cotton industry associations that worked hard to achieve this outcome. Dedicated industry leadership was also critically important in these efforts and to those I offer my thanks. Achieving this new policy would not have been possible without the tireless efforts of Congressman Mike Conaway, Chairman of the House Agriculture Committee, Senator Thad Cochran, Chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, the industry is also very grateful for uh, the key support from uh, members across the cotton belt. Before we review the program, let me address the importance of establishing a seed cotton policy in advance of the new Farm Bill and why it was necessary to convert generic base beginning in 2018 rather than 2019. Now, cotton producers needed an improved safety net as soon as possible, and the Supplemental Disaster Bill was the last legislative vehicle to accomplish that outcome. Uh, the Supplemental Disaster Bill provided an opportunity to add additional baseline funding through the changes uh, for dairy and cotton. Adding new money would not have been possible in the Farm Bill process and addressing cotton and dairy now will make the upcoming Farm Bill development a bit less difficult. Generic base acres are cotton based from the previous Farm Bill and were intended as a temporary measure to keep some support on those acres until a new cotton policy was implemented in Title I. The conversion of generic base in 2018, one year ahead of the new Farm Bill, helped ensure that the budget resources currently associated with generic acres would remain within the new cotton program and, within, and with other crops that will establish base acres by converting generic base to crop-specific bases. If the development of the cotton policy and conversion of generic base occurred in the context of the upcoming Farm Bill debate, there would have been many more interest involved who would want a portion of the generic base acre payments to go to their priorities instead. Strengthening the cotton program and converting generic base acres so that all payment acres are now decoupled from plantings should make it easier to defend and maintain the support levels and payment limit provisions that are critically important to Southern agriculture. With the approval of the provisions for cotton and dairy, the agriculture committees are in a much better position to move forward with development of the new Farm Bill. In the upcoming Farm Bill, cotton will be focused on maintaining the seed cotton policy our industry is also seeking improvements to the operation of the marketing loan program, enhancements in cotton flow, and increasing support for the U.S. textile industry. We anticipate the House Agriculture Committee will try to pass their version of the new Farm Bill out of committee by the end of the first quarter. The Senate Agriculture Committee is likely to follow shortly after. The committee bills must then be approved by their respective bodies and then work out any differences in a conference. All of this needs to occur by September 30th when some provisions of the existing Farm Bill begin to expire. Given the numerous attacks on ag policy by outside interest groups from across the political spectrum, it is critical that all of U.S. agriculture work together to defend the Farm Bill. Let me thank you for your participation in the conference call and webinar. Uh, also thank those that are hosting groups at your office. 
uh, if you would do us a favor to give us an idea of the number of people that we're reaching. You know, I asked those with groups just to give us a rough idea of the number at your location by typing the number of, of attendees into the webinar's chat window. We will take questions at the end of the presentation with the webinar chat window first and then open the conference lines. If you have any follow-up questions or need additional information after the webinar, you are always welcome to contact your NCC member services representative or contact myself or any of the staff of the National Cotton Council in either our Memphis or our Washington, D.C. office. I will now introduce Dr. Jody Campici, the Council's Vice President of Economic and Policy Analysis, who will take us through today's presentation. So, Jody, please go ahead. Okay, so we'll begin by going through the 2018 Seed Cotton Program information. And just as a reminder, the information that is presented today is based on our review of the legislative language. Final details are subject to change based on USDA's interpretation of the language and implementation. Seed Cotton Program uh, seed cotton is designated as a covered commodity eligible for Title I PLC and ARC programs in the 2014 Farm Bill, beginning with the 2018 crop. Seed cotton refers to the ungenned upland cotton that includes both lint and cotton seed. The reference price is set at 36.7 cents per pound. The price floor is set at 25 cents per pound. The seed cotton marketing your average price is a weighted average of the upland cotton lint price and the cotton seed price. The lint cotton seed prices are based, uh, weighted based on annual shares of production, so they change each year. To get to the price, we take the lint production times the lint price plus seed production times the seed price, and then we divide that by total lint production and seed production, and this is total U.S. lint and seed production. The marketing year average price is not final until the end of the marketing year. NAS will publish both the cotton seed marketing year average price and the lint marketing year average price. And that's usually published uh, early September, late October. Now, throughout the year, USDA does publish monthly estimates of the cotton seed price and the lint price. So we can estimate throughout the year what that price uh, would look like. And we will be providing information on our website to track these prices on a monthly basis. So as an example, let's assume that the cotton lint marketing your average price is 69 cents a pound. Let's assume the cotton seed marketing your average price is $150 a ton. So we take uh, total lint production and that's reported in, in bales, 480 pound bales, so we convert that to pounds. Cotton seed production is reported in tons, so we convert that to pounds as well, and then add the two together. And then to get to the seed cotton marketing or average price, we use the formula that I just went through. And if you get down to the bottom, you'll see that we've come up with weights, which for cotton lint, the weight is 0.4233. We're going to multiply that by 69 cents a pound. For cotton seed, the weight is 0.5767. We'll multiply that by the cotton seed price. We end up with a seed cotton marketing your average price of 33.53 cents. Now, I know I just mentioned this, but I want to mention again, this will change on an annual basis. These prices will change. There will be production values for uh, cotton seed and lint. So this chart shows a comparison over time of seed cotton prices compared to lint prices and cotton seed prices. So you can see seed cotton in the middle is a combination of the two. And one thing I want to point out is if you take a look at the 17 value, which will be out there beside 16, and you can see that while the lint price increased a bit for 17, the cotton seed price declined, and it brought down the seed cotton price as well. So this chart shows uh, how the cottonseed marketing your average price varies with different uh, lint prices and cottonseed prices. 
And I'm going to walk through this uh, and show you how we came up with the 33 cents, but I'm also going to mention that we have this spreadsheet on our website, and you can go in and look at this a little more closely so you can get an idea of how the prices will change. So using our example of a 69 cent lint price and a $150 a ton cotton seed price, you can see that the seed price that we just calculated and it's highlighted in red would be 33 cents. And of course, as you either move up or down, uh, let's say that the lint marketing your price is 61 cents and we have the same cotton seed marketing your average price of $100 a ton, you would see the, the seed cotton price drop to about 30 cents. Okay, so the seed cotton payment yield. The seed cotton yield is equal to the lint yield plus the cotton seed yield. This is also equal to 2.4 times the lint yield. Since the cottonseed yield is determined as 1.4 times the lint yield, and the 1.4 conversion factor is used because it is consistent with the approach in crop insurance. The upland cotton lint payment yield is equal to the higher of the CCP lint yield or the updated lint yield. So just as uh, producers had the opportunity to update yields for other commodities in the 2014 Farm Bill, the same option is available for cotton. So there'll be a one-time opportunity to update the yield based on 90% of the average of 2008 to 2012 actual yields, not counting years in which cotton was not grown. So just as an example, let's assume that the cotton lint yield is 800 pounds per acre. So to get to the pounds of cotton seed, we take 1.4 times 800 and you get 1,120 pounds per acre. To get the seed cotton payment yield, we're going to add those two together. So we're going to say 800 plus 1,120 equals 1,920 pounds per acre. Or this is also equal to 2.4 times 800. So that's kind of how we came up with how you get to uh, the 2.4. The seed cotton PLC payment rate is uh, based on the reference price minus the higher of the marketing year average price and the price floor. So a payment is only made when the reference price exceeds the higher of the marketing year average price and the price floor. The seed cotton payment rate is zero if the seed cotton marketing year average price is greater than 36.7 cents, which is the reference price. Paid on 85% of the farm's decoupled seed cotton base. So the, uh, the payment per base acre would be the PLC payment rate times the payment yield times 85%. And this is consistent with the PLC program for other commodities in the farm bill. Okay, so to walk through a seed cotton PLC payment example, we'll use the example that we did earlier with the seed cotton marketing your average price of 33 cents. So the seed cotton payment rate would be 36.7, which is the reference price, minus the higher of 33 cents, or the price floor of 25 cents. We get a payment rate, we multiply that payment rate times our seed cotton payment yield that we calculated earlier, which is 1,920 pounds. Multiply that by 85%, and you get a payment per base acre of 51 dollars and 73 cents. Okay, so the seed cotton base acres are established through the conversion of generic base acres. Generic base acres are not in effect beginning with the 2018 crop. For any farms with generic base and no covered commodities, including seed cotton, planted from 2009 to 2016, those generic base acres will become unassigned crop base and ineligible for PLC and ARC. Now, just to explain this point a bit further, you would remain eligible if one acre of one covered commodity was planted in any single year from 2009 to 2016. And this, uh, if none were planted, you would only be ineligible for seed cotton on generic base. 
basis does not affect existing base that you already have outside of uh, the current generic base. All existing base acres will remain the same. So if you did the base update uh, at the beginning of the 2014 Farm Bill, the base acres of those commodities will not change. And the conversion of seed cotton base We'll go through that as well. You'll either convert it to seed cotton or you can add some additional base of other commodities. Okay, so there's two options for the conversion or allocation of seed cotton base. So for all other farms who have generic base, you'll choose between option one, which is seed cotton base equals the higher of 2009 to 12 average seed cotton plantings or 80% of generic base and this cannot exceed total generic base. Any unconverted generic base becomes unassigned crop base and ineligible for PSC or ARC. Option two, all generic base is converted proportionally based on 2009 to 12 average plantings of seed cotton and other covered commodities. This is consistent with the option that you had at the beginning of the 2014 Farm Bill when you had the option to reallocate base based on covered commodities. This will work in the same way. This only applies to generic base. There will be no changes to existing base of other covered commodities. Okay, so let's walk through a couple of examples. Let's assume the farm has 500 acres of generic base. For 2009 to 2012, the average planted acres were 300 acres of cotton, 200 acres of corn, 200 acres of peanuts, and 100 acres of soybeans. So total covered commodities uh, would be 800 acres. Under option one, the seed cotton base would equal the higher of 2009 to 12 average planted acres, which would be 300, or 80% of 500 generic base acres, which would be 400. So seed cotton base in this example, in this option would be 400 acres. An assigned base would be 100 acres. Option two, allocate the 500 acres of generic base to the crops planted uh, from 9 to 12, so the average 9 to 12 plantings. And in this case, as we showed on in the previous slide, 300 acres of cotton was planted, so it would be 300 by total covered commodity plantings, which was 800. And we're going to multiply that by the 500 acres of generic base. We did the same for corn, peanuts, and soybeans. So the full 500 acres of generic base would be allocated to cotton, corn, peanuts, and soybeans. So this option is available if uh, someone wanted to actually get more peanut base or corn base. And again, both options would be available in the first option, 100 acres goes to an unassigned base. The second option, there would be no unassigned base. Okay, the next example. Let's assume total generic base equals 500 acres. Nine to 12 planted acres would be 500 acres of cotton, 200 acres of wheat, and 100 acres of sorghum. So total covered commodities would be 800 acres. Nine to 12 average planted cotton acres is 500. 80% of 500 is 400. In this example, seed cotton base would be 500. So we would take the nine to 12 average planted cotton acres. Unassigned base would be zero. Option two, allocate the 500 acres of generic to the crops planted from nine to 12. So you would end up with cotton, wheat, and sorghum base. Okay, next example. Generic base is 500, 600 acres of cotton planted uh, on average from nine to 12, 200 acres of corn. So total covered commodities would be 800. So option one, nine to 12 planted cotton acres is 600. 80% of generic is 400. In this example, you'll notice that of course, uh, the rule is seed cotton base cannot be greater than generic base. So the seed cotton base under option one would be 500. Unassigned base would be zero. In option two, we would allocate the 500 acres to cotton and corn. Okay, the next example. 
generic base of 500, cotton plantings of 100, corn of 100, and then alfalfa, a non-covered commodity, 600 acres. So when we add total covered commodities, it's 200 acres because we only count the cotton and the corn. So 2009 to 12, average planted cotton acres is 200. 80% of the generic base is 400. Seed cotton base in this example and this option would be 400. Unassigned base would be 100. Under option two, you can allocate the 500 acres of generic base to cotton and corn. So even though only 200 acres of covered commodities <coughs> were planted, you still get to allocate the full 500 acres of generic base, and you end up with 250 acres of cotton and 250 acres of corn. Okay, just to walk through a couple examples of the PLC payments. And I just want to point out as well that this spreadsheet, along with the price uh, spreadsheet that we saw earlier, is available on our website. You can change the lent payment yield, which is the number at the top. In this example, it's in red and it's 600, and it will automatically calculate uh, the numbers and the payments for you. So in this example, the lent payment yield is 600. The seed cotton payment yield is 600 times 2.4, which is 1,440 pounds. So using the prices in the example that we uh, went through earlier, if we had a lent marketing or average price of 69 cents, and a cottonseed marketing your average price of $150 a ton, the payment would be $39 an acre. Now let's say that the lint marketing your average price dropped to 63 cents a pound. And let's say the cottonseed price remained at $150 a ton. Therefore, go follow the rows in the column across to where they meet up and you would have a payment of $70 an acre. Okay, so that's a yield of 600. Let's look at a yield of 800. So in this example, the lint payment yield is 800 pounds. Multiply that by 2.4, and you get 1,920. And again, on the website, on the website, uh, all that will calculate. All you need to do is put, 100, put in that payment yield of 800 or, or whatever your payment yield is. And in these uh, spreadsheets, this has already been multiplied by 85%. Okay, so in this example, let's look at the 69 cents and the 150, and we get a payment per base acre of $52. We wanna do the same thing we did earlier. Let's say the price went to 63 cents, and look across to 150, and you would get a payment of $93 an acre. Okay, the next example, let's look at a payment yield of 1,000. Okay, 69 cent marketing your average price for lint and $150 cottonseed price would be a payment of $65 an acre. Okay, now let's say that the lint marketing your average price stayed at 69 and let's say the cottonseed price actually increased to $180 an acre. You go across where those two meet up and you would get a payment of $47 an acre. Okay, so for other details, for the 2018 crop, the Stax Insurance product may be purchased four acres of upland cotton planted on a farm enrolled in the Seed Cotton PLC and ART program. Now, going past 2018, the language states that Stax would not be available for a farm enrolled in PLC. So this only applies to 2018. For 2019 and beyond, the way the language currently states is that you would not be able to have both stacks uh, and a PLC on the same farm. Now, we are approaching sales closing dates, and to have stacks, obviously, you need to purchase it before the sales closing date. The non-recourse marketing assistance loan for upland cotton lint remains unchanged for the 2014 Farm Bill with an upland cotton loan rate of 52 cents per pound for the 2018 crop. PLC and ART payments for seed cotton are subject to the payment limits of 125,000, but it also applies to other covered commodities other than peanuts. 
and we will be providing some ARC examples on the website as well. So the decisions that will need to be made, and again, I just want to uh, make this pretty clear that this is only for the 2018 crop uh, that these decisions are being made for. Landowners will update payment yields if the updated yield is greater than the CCP yield. Also, choose between base update options. And I wanted to specifically mention landowners because many of you will remember at the implementation of the 14 Farm Bill that landowner signatures were required or power of attorney. And you know you need to make sure that if you have a power of attorney that your current power of attorney applies to this as well. So producers will choose between PLC or ART. It'll be a, a one-time election for the 2018 crop year for each farm with seed cotton base. If all producers on a farm fail to make a unanimous election for PLC or ART, the farm will be assumed to choose PLC for seed cotton. And I just want to reiterate that FSA has not announced a sign-up date yet. Uh, they are not quite ready for you to come in and start uh, looking for this data and making decisions. However, it is important for you to go ahead and start thinking about the data that you're going to need. So you can gather similar information used during implementation of the 14 Farm Bill. You'll need yield records from 2008 to 2012. You'll need planning history from 2009 to 2012. And at the appropriate time, you can check with your local FSA office for additional information. We will be providing information on our website at www.cotton.org, and if you look in the chat box, you can also see the direct link to all of our information on the Seed Cotton program. The webinar from today, the PowerPoint presentation, will be available along with a document of frequently asked questions and, answer, uh, and answers, and then any other information that we have to update you with, we will provide that on the website as well. We'll also be tracking the NAS marketing your average prices for cotton seed and lint, and then of course we'll provide the calculation for the seed cotton marketing your average price throughout the marketing year. Thank you for participating in the webinar, and thank you for your support of the National Cotton Council. We will now be taking uh, questions via chat first, and then we'll open up the conference lines as well. All right, thank you, Jody, and uh, and again, encourage. This is Gary again, and I've got uh, Craig Brown and, and several staff with me here in our conference room in Memphis. Uh, we do again thank you for your participation. Uh, we are going to leave the conference lines in lecture mode for for a bit, uh, just to cut down on background noise, and then as as we can try to work through some of the questions that will come up in the chat windows. Uh, and we appreciate. Uh, Appreciate those questions coming, and we can now, you've got quite a bit of time to be able to use some of that. Uh, a question came up uh, uh, regarding uh, being able to sign for landowners if we have power of attorney. Yes, you should be able to do that. Uh, you obviously want to make sure that it's still current and the power of attorney that you had when these decisions were made for other crops. In the, uh, uh, and if it's for all decisions, then you should be able to handle that for those landowner decisions. But that's probably a good thing just to double check in the interim is to make sure that power of attorney does cover all decisions and is up to date. Uh, another question has come up about, <coughs> excuse me, about, uh, <coughs> excuse me, an ARC, a county ARC example. Uh, we don't have one posted uh, now, but we will have one posted, I would say, uh, in the next uh, couple of days that we will get some examples of uh, county level ARC how those calculations work and what would be expected payments. Uh, so you're right, because that is a decision that will come before the producers is choosing between uh, PLC or county level ARC. And just to clarify, after after the 18 crop, the prohibition for, for taking stacks does apply to PLC or ARC. So uh, uh, you have an opportunity to, to, to buy both, to participate in both programs this year, but after this year, you must choose between PLC or, or stacks. A couple of other questions coming in on uh, on the 
the webinar chat window uh, regarding uh, the, the cottonseed price and how that's calculated. Both the both the lint price and the cottonseed price are are NAS data products. So NAS reports those on a monthly basis. In terms of the source for cottonseed, that is, uh, they rely on the NAS relies on the Jennings report uh, for the reporting of cottonseed prices, and those are designed to be a, a cottonseed price as received by a farmer. So the the actual source of that does come from the the Jennings report. Uh, as always, we encourage. Uh, you know, participation in those in those USDA data collecting efforts so that we do have the most accurate information. Um, question here about the choice between stacks and uh, the uh, seed cotton program going forward. Uh, it is the case uh, as 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 it being on an annual basis. Um, that is the intent of this legislation is that it is an annual basis. Uh, Obviously, we we assume that once we look beyond this year and we see the new farm bill, if it carries over the same structure and requirements as the previous farm bill, then uh, there's a one-time election versus county ARC or PLC, but there's an annual enrollment, and a producer then would have to, the opportunity to look at perhaps where the market is and what stacks looks like uh, for the possibility of a PLC or ARC payment and decide, do they want to enroll in PLC and ARC in that given year or purchase stacks in that year? So it is, from that perspective, an annual decision. Uh, question coming in about uh, seed cotton. If you choose ARC, can you update yields too? Uh, I, I don't know if you went through the process of yield updates in the previous county level ARC program, but those don't factor into the actual calculations that I recall. We'll double check because those are based off of county those level yield. Average, those are average prices. Yeah, those are they don't, but could you update that? We'll check and see whether the records could have been updated on that. So that's a good question on updating county level ARC or yields, even if you were going with the county level ARC option. Uh, Question again about updating yields. Uh, we think that's going to be the case, that uh, it'll be done similar to what was done with other crops in the 2014 Farm Bill, looking at that yield information from 2008 to 2012 and taking 90% of that uh, in terms of uh, the, the records. That would either be FSA records or your insurance records that would be used as the source of the data for the yield update. Uh, yeah, question about uh, on on cottonseed prices. Uh, you know, given this year where we've got in some locations cottonseed prices are approximately $115 per ton. Uh, you know, one one thing, and you might look at that matrix as you, as you have a chance to go back and look at the matrix we did for uh, for purposes of that matrix. I think it started at 140 and went went up. We were just kind of picking ranges that we could show on, on a matrix. Uh, that price is going to go down as low as it needs to go, and it really gets down to when the lint price, the combination of the lint price and the cottonseed price, when you take the weighted average of that, they actually get down to uh, below $0.25. Cents. At that point, then the price floor kicks in in terms of creating a maximum PLC payment rate. And I believe, uh, in thinking back to the price matrix, that was put together that we hadn't quite reached a price floor at 50 cents and $140 per ton. I think it was I think it was just slightly over 25 point something. So yes, as prices go lower than that, they will factor in, but when the seed cotton price goes below 25 cents, uh, then uh, then you're going to max out PLC uh, cotton seed prices uh, as as the lint prices uh, will be treated in the same manner as they are for other uh, for the ARC and, and PLC programs for other commodities, and, and namely that is that these are national prices that are weighted by uh, production levels and and weighted by month for uh, monthly prices are weighted by marketings and they're also weighted by production. So it is a national average price. Uh, we understand that. That certainly affects regions of the country differently, looking at what a regional price may be uh, in the southeast versus other parts of the cotton belt, particularly on, on cottonseed. 
<clears throat> but these are uh, national prices, and again, that was largely dictated by the uh, uh, by the construct that was already put in place for PLC and ARC under the 2014 Farm Bill. Uh, I had a question here on uh, some of the other activities that are ongoing within uh, support that we're trying to achieve, specifically a ginning cost share program. Uh, and that's been another thrust of the National Cotton Council over the last year or so. Uh, we appreciate uh, a lot of effort by the industry in, in terms of putting letters into the USDA to do another ginning cost share program. We're continuing to monitor that and stay in close contact with USDA. Uh, we don't have any definitive word, but we've we've sent, we've uh, from the USDA at this point in time. But we do think that is still under strong consideration for a Jennings cost share program that would apply to the 2016 level of. Uh, I do think if it comes about, it will probably be about uh, half the level of money that was allocated for the first uh, Gen cost share program. Uh, so we hope uh, uh, we hope we can see that at some point. In, in the future, but again, that's another effort we're continuing to monitor. There, there was a question uh, posed about about signing out of stacks. Well, for 2018, if you if you sign up for stacks by the sales closing date, and eventually you sign into the seed cotton program, you can participate in both programs for this year only. Uh, in the future, we'll have to find out what the procedure is to, to, to pick one or the other, but you will not be allowed to participate in both uh, from the 19 crop forward, assuming that continues to be a provision in the new farm bill. Uh, it would work the same way as, as, the, ARC, uh, as the ARC SCO option uh, was in the 2014 farm bill where you could not participate, that if you participated in ARC, you could not participate in uh, in SCO, so we assumed it would be the same process for for stacks and PLC arc uh, for the out years. There's a question regarding the 90 day window um, when the bill is signed, and that you know technically that window started when the bill was signed on February 9th. Uh, so we know the clock is ticking. Uh, we understand um, the USDA is already looking at uh, uh, implementation. Uh, we think they've already, we've had USDA folks that have already met with uh, uh, congressional committee staff about implementation. In fact, we'll be talking to some uh, USDA staff in Washington, D.C. Uh, tomorrow afternoon about implementation. Uh, so USDA is already moving forward with it. It will take some time, though, and again, uh, they still have to, even though the the processes are similar to what they did in the 2014 Farm Bill, still have to go through uh, the steps of collecting the information, uh, developing the reg the regs. Uh, so would assume as they move close, you know, move through the spring, we're going to learn more about uh, the details of the program. And then we had a question about uh, the price used for the Lent price and how it compares to the ICE futures. Good question. Uh, and this will be part of the information that we will post on the Council's website in terms of updating those monthly prices and how they compare to either the world price or the ICE futures. And one of the things that we've looked at historically is that, you know, this is a, this is a NAS market year average price, so it's designed to be a, a farm gate price. Uh, back to the back to the grower, so it's not it's not the world market price as constituted by the A index, nor is it the I futures. What we've historically seen, though, is as kind of a rule of thumb that we use is that if you look at uh, the I futures and the basis between what USDA publishes for a national market year average price, we typically see that uh, that differential be somewhere around I don't know six to eight cents per pound. Kind of use a working number of seven cents per pound. So that, if, in other words, if you had uh, New York futures trading at about 75 cents per pound, then uh, you would expect the, the, the NAS market year average price to come in around 68 cents per pound. 
again, that basis is going to change based on the quality of the crop, based on a number of other factors. But in general, uh, that may be a um, that you can use in terms of uh, in terms of price. And then for the 2017 crop, and you know, we can think back to where the futures contracts have been trading over these last several months. For the 2017 crop, Jody used a price of 69 cents per pound. That's the current midpoint for the for the supply and demand balance sheet for this year. And while you may be thinking about other questions, we'll uh, on the on the chat window we'll see if there's uh, any other points that we did not add. This time we're gonna we're gonna take the conference lines out of lecture mode. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. The conference is in lecture mode. In lecture mode. We hope the back uh, again encourage people to keep that noise to a minimum and mute your own phone if you're not asking a question. But we want to give conference call participants a chance for questions. We did have another question come in on the uh, uh, on the on the webinar, and it was the timing of payments. And what I'll remind growers is that uh, the of these payments will be the same as, and we're getting a lot of background noise on one of the lines, the timing of these payments will be the same as they are under the PLC arc. In other words, the 2018 crop payments will be made in October of 2019. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. It's in lecture mode. Oh. Sorry, we were getting a lot of background noise, so we put that back on. So in, in general, the payments will be made in uh, October of 2019. The conference is in lecture mode. So right now, if you have questions, use the chat line to, 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 to punch in your questions, please. Uh, do have another question coming to the chat line about expectations of a new farm bill for 2019. You're asking specifically about the council's expectations, so that's nothing like putting us on the spot and trying to look ahead to what Congress may do. Uh, what I'll say, and, and you know, going back to uh, uh, Congressman Conaway, Chairman of the House Ag Committee, who was at our annual meeting uh, back in uh, early February, uh, he was very, very clear in his intent to, uh, to move things forward, particularly now that, that cotton and dairy were addressed in the supplemental disaster bill. He felt like that really paved the way for him to move forward with his committee markup sometime as he was saying, uh, by the end of March would be his ideal timeline. Have the Senate Agriculture Committee follow, uh, hopefully shortly thereafter, and then give them several months to work out the differences by September 30th. Now, having said all that, uh, and I and I certainly think they're going to make every effort to do that. And I'm frankly, with cotton and dairy addressed uh, to some degree in the supplemental disaster bill, I think it gives them a much better chance of getting the farm bill done. Uh, on time or at least done by the end of this year. But uh, we also have to realize that in the past, farm bills have, have, have struggled to be completed on time. We've seen extensions in the past. Uh, and so we have to realize that's, a, that's a, a possibility, particularly when we look at the fact that elections are coming up. This is an election year. And so we're going to have, particularly after the August recess, uh, the House focused on elections. So there's a lot to be done. Uh, and I think it's hard to handicap that right now. I would just say we have two very motivated chairmen of the agriculture committees that are going to be pushing hard to get this done. Okay, we're just looking at a... Uh, so I think we've got a question with multiple uh, farm numbers. Decision yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah. So the decision upon the base on the option one versus option two is a farm number by farm number decision. That's a good point for clarification. Uh, it may, depending on the uh, depending on the crop mix, uh, uh, 
you know, it may be a different decision in terms of which one is, is the way to go, but that is a farm number by farm number decision. And there's a question about, about the unassigned base, if those acres will be lost. Uh, the base acres we won't be lost. It's just if there's no, uh, and this is, this is just for seed cotton payments, if there's uh, our generic base payments. If, if there's no covered commodity planted in uh, 9 through 16, then, then there is zero payment on those generic base acres. Uh, but, but it's clear that they will maintain the base acreage, uh, but for 18, there will be no payments on those acres. So you're right. The secretary is, is mandated by this leg legislation to maintain the records for those farms about how many unassigned base acres there are. And it, it's also clear that this only applies to the generic acres. You would still get the payments on the uh, covered commodity base acres that are already established on the farm. And there was a question about, uh, again, with multiple farm numbers, choosing PLC for one and stacks for another. Uh, I think the way that would be written, and again, this would be applicable for the 2019 crop, not the 2018 crop, because it can be, uh, can essentially have, have both in 2018. But looking ahead to 2019, I think the way the policy is written on stacks, similar to the way ARC is that, uh, whether you purchase or, or SCO, excuse me, SCO and ARC, you're going to purchase stacks on all acres that are not enrolled in the uh, the PLC or ARC program. There was a question about about uh, LDPs on the marketing loans. Uh, th this this legislation has no effect on that. The marketing loan for cotton is still in for cotton lend is still in effect, and and all the provisions of the marketing loan are, are intact. The loan rate for the 2018 crop uh, for cotton is 52 cents a pound. So not, nothing in this legislation, this current legislation, uh, impacts the loan program. There was a question here about the uh, the last year on peanut payments, or what is the last year on peanut payments, and. So be clear whether we're talking about peanut payments or, or any other covered commodity. Uh, and if we're specifically thinking about the treatment of generic base, uh, so for the 17 crop, those generic base acres were attributed, uh, could have been attributed to those covered commodities that were planted on generic base. So in the case of peanuts, for the 17 crop, those would have been attributed uh, to peanuts if peanuts had been planted on that, and that would have, those payments would come in October of 2018. Now, as we look ahead to the 2018 crop, generic acres uh, are not allowed to be attributed to peanuts or any other commodity because generic acres are, are not in effect. What will apply to some farms is that uh, when a farm looks at his options, and if there were plantings of peanuts on that farm from 2009 to 2012, they could choose option two, which would be the reallocation option and actually create decoupled peanut base. And if the case, and, and we go back to an option, because uh, again, explaining the option to update peanut base. So we're, if update generic base, if we go back to a farm that has generic base on it and peanut base, and let's say that's the mix today, those peanut base acres that have been in, in effect for the 2014 farm bill, those remain in effect and, and those do not change. So let's just kind of take that peanut base and, and set it aside because those peanut base acres remain on this farm. Now, if we look at what may happen with the acres on that farm, it is those acres that will be reallocated. And if the planting history from 2009 to 12 included peanuts, that farm may choose to take those acres and allocate them to, let's say it was a cotton and peanut planting history, allocate them to cotton and allocate them to peanuts. If the producer chooses to do that, those generic acres that are now allocated to peanuts become new decoupled peanut base acres eligible for the peanut PLC program just as the, base, uh, the, pe 
the uh, the existing peanut base acres. So those didn't change. Eligibility for those existing peanut base acres are unchanged. And now through this reallocation of generic base, that farm may have the opportunity, if it chooses option two, to actually have more peanut acres. And those acres would also be eligible if there's any PLC peanut payment for the 2018 crop, those new acres would be eligible in the same manner that the existing acres are. And then there was a question about payment limits. Uh, uh, work, how would payment limits work for uh, uh, for this under the uh, under the times of low prices when there may be a, a PLC payment as well as a potential uh, POP or, or LDP payment? Uh, this does uh, this seed cotton program will attribute to the $125,000 that applies to $125,000 payment limit that applies to all covered commodities other than peanuts. And so, yes, that is something to be uh, to keep in mind, be concerned about, is that if we move into a situation of low uh, seed cotton prices, there will be uh, PLC payments that can apply if we move low enough and the grower chooses to do loan deficiency payments or POP payments through the Upland Cotton Marketing Loan Program, those will also apply to that same $125,000 payment limit. Now, the other thing to keep in mind when we, when we think about the use of marketing loans and its application to the payment limits is to remember that uh, if, a, if, the loan, if the cotton is put into loan, and redeem with commodity certificates, then any marketing loan gains through the use of certificates do not apply to the payment limit. So if we get into a situation of low prices and we're looking at potentially a, a significant PLC payment for seed cotton as well as the potential for marketing loan gains under the Upland Cotton Marketing Loan Program, uh, growers probably do well to look at what opportunities there are by going through the loan and using the commodity certificates for the redemption. Certainly appreciate all the all the questions that are coming. So, extremely helpful. I'm still pulling some others in uh, from other. A <coughs> uh, question came in about uh, if we plant cotton on unassigned acres in 2019, can those acres uh, purchase the Stacks insurance product. Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's, a I, form, it's a form number by form number decision. Uh, so if you if you if you line up if you enroll an FSA farm number <clears throat> in the seed cotton program, then any acreage planted on that farm number would not be eligible for Stacks, whether it's unassigned or not. Yeah. Uh, and then, as Gary said, all the other then the stacks requirement is that you have stacks coverage on all the other farm numbers in the county that are not in the seed cotton program. So uh, it is a farm number by farm number decision on stacks versus seed cotton. And I, and I, and I, and I, to go further with Craig's point there, I think if and if only if the farm had all unassigned acres because of the non-planting in the 09 to 16, so that it wasn't eligible for PLC, or right, could, yeah. it be, could it be stacks? But some partial unassigned, if, uh, yeah. then that's gonna be a problem in terms of purchasing uh, right. stacks on those products, on those acres. Uh, we've got a uh, question here, and, and I think this question came up in an earlier uh, conversation about a farm. What's going to what happens with a uh, with a farmer now who has a farm that's come under his control that was not in his control in 2012 or prior to 2012 in terms of the yield records? Okay, we believe that that uh, you can go back to either FSA and look at the at, look at the yield history on that farm if it was turned in and certified, 
uh, or we believe you'll be able to use RMA yields as a substitute. Um, we're, we believe they will follow the same procedure that, that other commodities use for yield updates uh, in the beginning of the 2014 Farm Bill. Uh, we have no reason to believe it, that, that seed cotton would be treated any differently. Uh, so I think you'll be able to either reconstruct uh, the FSA yields on the farm or you can find uh, RMA yields. There's also a provision that if you didn't have yields that you could substitute uh, some county yields, we believe, uh, to fill in that information. But that will be made clearer when the implementation rules come out as far as yield updates. But we would think it would be consistent on how it was done for the, tw for the other covered commodities on the 2014 Farm Bill. Okay, there's a question about, about sign-up. Now, we, we need to emphasize that, that this legislation right now only applies to the 18 crop. Obviously, if this farm bill gets extended, it would apply uh, to future crops as long as the 14 farm bill is in effect. So the sign-up that you're doing for seed cotton, uh, the decisions you make on, on PLC or R, really right now are only applicable for the 2018 crop. We'll have to see what provisions are in place in the next farm bill as far as, as, far as sign-up is concerned and as far as options are concerned. There was another question about uh, the, uh, the cottonseed price that was used in the example of $150 per ton. Uh, and that was for illustrative purposes. Uh, we did look at, uh, if we look at a USDA product, they put out a monthly product that uh, deals with the oil seeds, uh, and, and they put together a price range of what their expectations are on uh, on cottonseed prices, I think their current range is about 130 to 170 dollars, so it's somewhat of a, a wide range. We plugged in 150 dollars just as a midpoint. Uh, now going back, and I'll uh, see if any of the other staff remember more specifically. When we look at the monthly prices that have been reported, I know that we have seen. I want to say that many of the prices have actually been below one $150 per ton. So we've seen some numbers on the monthlies that are closer to 130 to 140 in some of the NAS monthly numbers. So at some point, that's going to get. Uh, you have to realize that's the that's the data that's being tracked on a on a real time basis, uh, and weighted versus what USDA is saying as a as a projected price. Uh, and, and so I would again. You know, there's been some questions and concerns about the weighting that, that goes into it and the fact it's a national average price. I just, you know, in, encourage strong participation on uh, uh, in those reports that come out and, and make sure that they've got accurate information and appropriately capturing uh, the data. Uh, good question that's come up here in the chat window about what, if, what happens if a farm sells after the decisions are made, uh, there's precedent for this answer because this would have already in. Uh, already happened. But I believe that that one-time decision that is made on ARC versus PLC is actually going to be locked in even under the change of ownership. Correct. And and a lot of things too is looking forward. And we don't want to speculate too much about what the next farm bill may hold, but. This is a decision for 2018. I think, you know, one of the things that we've heard is as different groups look at reauthorization, uh, it may very likely include a new decision, a new one-time decision between ARC and PLC uh, once that new legislation is put in place. But again, that takes place uh, effect for next year. This is really just looking at what this means for this year. Uh, got a question about what the payment would have been uh, per acre in 2016. <clears throat> I think if we remember back, we'll we can run some numbers and put some examples out that'll give a little more history. Uh, we're kind of working off a of memory right now that if we go back to that uh, that seed cotton uh, price chart that you saw, where uh, we had a little bit of a of a of a downward tick in the uh, 
in the seed cotton price from 2016 to 2017 due to lower cotton seed, I want to say we went from maybe 34 cents to 33 and a half, that in that regard, the payment probably would have been somewhat similar, maybe slightly smaller. And I think what we saw was a slight increase in the lint price, but a more significant decrease in the cotton seed price going from 2016 to 2017. Uh, and, the, and those somewhat offsetting themselves, but I believe the 2017 price was actually slightly of a slightly downturn from the 2016 price. It was about 68 cents, I think. So uh, we, we can provide, though, when we go back to that chart uh, uh, that calculated those historical prices from 1990 forward, one thing we can do is also accompany that with calculations of, of what that would have meant on a uh, uh, on, on a payment rate, uh, I do think there were, a, you know, a number of years where this program would have been very helpful in coming in and providing support to producers when we look back at that historical uh, price series. There were obviously some years where we had, you know, some very strong lint prices, maybe in excess of 80 cents, where the seed cotton price uh, was in the upper 30s to around 40 cents a pound. Otherwise, though, I think it tended to drop uh drop below what the reference price is in this program. I see we've still got some people uh, typing in, so we appreciate uh, everyone's participation and, and use of the webinar in the chat window. And again, I encourage everyone to, if you have questions, uh, you know, we're uh, in, in this webinar uh, from the Southeast, always uh, feel free to reach out to uh, uh, your member services representative, which is, which is Jim Davis. Uh, he is always accessible, but in, in addition, uh, you're always welcome to uh, touch base with us here in the Memphis office or the D.C. office. And also, as Jody said, you be reminded that we do have a follow-up webinar uh, a week from this week from today at 10 o'clock Central Time that anyone can participate in. So if you want to hear it again, uh, it'll be the same information. Uh, and we got a question again, kind of going back to the uh, same type of, of question about farms that have either you didn't own or maybe that you uh, you didn't rent and, and operate and uh prior to the decisions being made, what happens? And again, we think those decisions, uh, that one-time choice conveys with, uh, with the farm. And, and so, yes, if you're a new renter, uh, that, prop, that does come into play and uh, carries over as you, as you pick up a new farm. And we're going to open up the conference lines, but if you're on a cell phone or if you're not willing to ask questions, if you would mute your phone, that would help us uh, clear up the conference line. So we're going to open them back up uh, for our oral questions. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. No longer in lecture mode. So does anyone have a, an oral question you want to ask on the conference line that, that you couldn't type in? Y'all there? Yeah, we're here. This is Tony Leister in Moultrie, Georgia. Uh, go back over that year one more time. We got some questions. Whenever you was, whenever it's talking about, whenever you go in and you prove your yield, and this is just simple figures. If you got a nine, if you got a thousand pound yield, you're gonna take ninety percent of that, and that's where you're gonna be gonna have a nine hundred pound payment yield times the two point four. I understand that. Okay. The lady said a while ago when she was talking about the chart, she said when she was talking about the 30-something dollars, she kept saying that that 30-something dollars reflects the 85%. Does that right. mean that we go, if we got a 900-pound yield, we only going to get paid on 85% of that 900 pounds? 
Well, the current the, the, the current PLC programs are paid on 85% of your base acres. That's what she was referring to. So that, that table, that, 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 that matrix that she showed you, those numbers per acre were already factored by the 85%. So that's a net payment per acre uh, given the, uh, the counter cyclical payment yield that you updated. It converts to a seed cotton yield automatically in that, in that spreadsheet and that corresponds to those values you see at the various levels of lint and seed prices. Well, that wasn't the way we 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 took it. I understand what you're saying. Now it's gonna be you gonna you're only gonna get paid on 85 percent of your acres at your full yield. Right. That is correct. Yes. Sir. And that, and that and that updated yield, as you said, is 90 is 90 percent of the 08 through 12 actual yield. You also don't have to put years in which you planted no cotton. So it's only the, the, the planted acreage of cotton in the years 08 through 12 times 90%. Okay, when you go back to the LDP and the PLC payment on cotton and the limitation, are yes, they gonna be, is there any, gonna be any generic certificates? Yes, sir, generic certificates are still in effect. Uh, that's in the current law. So that if you if, if there's a marketing loan gain, it would behoove you not to go get an LDP, but rather to run it through the loan, and then certificates apply, and then there's no limit on the marketing loan gains if you run it through the loan. And even if you want to do what's called an in and out loan, you can just put it in the loan one day and take it out the same day, and have the same effect of getting an LDP. But LDPs or pop payments count against the limit. Marketing loan gains through loan redemptions do not. Okay, I understand there's some talk up there right now about cutting out one of the 125s. Is there any truth to that? Well, payment limits are always going to be a, a debatable issue in the next farm bill. They always come under attack. So I'm sure we'll have to defend the separate payment limits uh, and the current payment limits. President's budget eliminated. And in the president, and, and you may have seen that the president's. Uh, does alter the payment limits, but that's 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 not unusual for any president's budget. But we can anticipate uh, a fight again over payment limits and eligibility rules in the next farm bill debate. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Let me go while we're maybe thinking about another question or two. We did have a couple of more questions come in on the webinar, and one question was: Is, is sequestration still in effect? Uh, and yes, the answer to that is. Uh, that sequestration is still in effect, and once these payments are conveyed, they will be subject to this, whatever the sequestration percentage is for the 2018 crop will also apply to these payments. So there's been no uh, – I do think the, the budget agreement that came out in February addressed sequestration maybe for, for defense and some of the discretionary spending, but for mandatory non-defense spending such as uh, farm program payments, sequestration is still in effect. Um, uh, then a question was about uh, the market year average prices. Uh, those those monthlies are weighted by the average bales marketed on the lint side, and then it's also our understanding that uh, the seed is is also reflects the uh, the amount marketed. Uh, one final question was the extent to which FSA has RMA yields uh, in their uh, system. Uh, that's a very good question. They're supposed to, they're they're supposed to be, supposed and, and, to be synced. Yeah. Yes, they are supposed to be synced, uh, and I know there's been some headway made on that to try to uh, to try to make that a little bit uh, more of a seamless process and have those in their system. A question came in in the 09 to 12 uh, average of cotton plantings, and. Let's say you've got that you've got those uh, four years of data, and the question specifically related to one year where you may have had plantings in excess of your base. Uh, can you still use for that single year that larger number in the average? Uh, we will we will verify this obviously in in FSX, but our understanding would be that yes, that one year, even though it's above uh, the the generic base can be used fully in the average and then as long as the average is not above generic base then you're going you'll you'll be assigned 
uh, the average that was above generic base when you averaged all the years together, then you'd be capped at a generic base. But I don't believe they do not cap each individual year. That's correct. Any other oral questions over the conference line? Well, we're not seeing any other questions being uh, typed in right now. Uh, we certainly don't want to uh, cut off any discussion, uh, but we also want to be mindful of your time. Uh, and I want to ask one more question, if I may. Yes, sir. Yes, go sir. Ahead. Absolutely. Uh, according to this update that y'all put out, the update payment yields is based off of 8 through 12. It's not through 9 through 12? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and that, and that's and and the reason that's in there that that's synonymous with what the the 2014 farm bill allowed updated of other covered commodity yields. So it's the same provision. Thank you. Well, again, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for their participation and uh, just encourage you to. Uh, uh, Stay in touch uh, with the web for any updated program information. So, wish you well in 2018. Oh, I have one more question. Again. This conference.